May we pray? Gracious and holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Wait for it. On the television show, How I Met Your Mother, the suit-wearing, womanizing Barney Stinson, a bachelor who knows his game, has a few catchphrases. One of them, he'll split a word apart and put the phrase, wait for it, in the middle. As I sat in front of my computer to prepare this week's sermon, this was the only phrase I had in my mind. Wait for it. As I sat in my office staring at a blank computer screen, books and hymnals sprawled open on the desk, my frustration rising higher as the only thing in my mind was the phrase, wait for it. I knew I wanted to write this week's sermon on patience. After all, it's a virtue and it's what God demands from Habakkuk. And yet I couldn't catch the irony staring right back at me from that bright, blank, mocking computer screen. I couldn't sit still the longer I sat, getting more and more anxious as the hours went by, making lists of the things I still had to do, still had to write, still had to tape, while the only thing I heard was, wait for it. There's a joke that pastors preach what they need to hear, but this week I didn't have time to focus on patience. Our world is filled, and mine is no different, with Jobs, and driving, and family, and meetings, and chores, and doctors, and banks, and things to do, and things we've done. We celebrate our success with check marks and evaluate our days with the question, what'd you do today? As if that might be the best reflection of who we are. Our accomplishments matter, the faster the better, because speed seems to count in this circular world. If there's one phrase we dislike, one line we detest, one saying that says we are not worth our salt, it's wait for it. And this is where Habakkuk was in our reading from today, where he cries out to God, How come, God, how come? How come I see what's wrong? I live through the trouble, I call out for help, and nothing. I stand here on watch, I wait for your word. And then God responds and says, wait for it. But with destruction before me and strife here beside me, I can't help but wonder if the wicked are winning. When there's illness and bills and age, but no pension, it's hard to understand promise and presence. When the chaos of our world, its hustle and bustle and rigmarole, lets quotes become viral regardless of context, promoting hatred and judgment before understanding, so each side is right and despises the other. It's hard to trust in mercy and vision. But God did respond amidst all this trouble, saying, Trust in what I have told you before. Write out the vision. Make it plain. Proclaim it out loud. So even if someone's rushing past you in the hustle and bustle, they'll still see it. For there is still a vision. I promise you that. If it seems like it's dawdling, wait for it. What God seems to remind us, and we tend to forget, is that promise isn't proof, it's focus. Focus is the spot you stare at in the distance, so that regardless of what's going on around you, you can keep your distance. Patience allows us to trust in these things, the knowledge in the core of our being, so we don't get caught up in the chaos around. We might hear viral quotes taken out of context, but with promise and vision and focus and patience, we don't let them become our truth. We separate bustle from better, hassle from higher, and when we're not sure, we wait for it. I can't help but wonder about our little man Zacchaeus and if he was a victim of perceptions and hustle. He's a tax collector, and the rest of the Jews knew what that meant. 
It meant he worked for the Romans, that he had turned his back on his own people in order to get ahead. Because, see, they knew what he did. They didn't even need to talk to him. They had his kind all figured out. Because they knew other tax collectors, see, the kind that took more than Rome required to line their own pockets, the kind that stole from their neighbors in ways that were protected by law. He was so begrudged, so ignored, pushed away from the rest of the crowd that he had nothing left to lose, no pride left to protect when he climbed a tree to clasp a glimpse of Jesus. So from that point of view, when we know his kind, we celebrate that Jesus changed him. That meeting Jesus, being honored by his presence, calls Zacchaeus to give some huge above and beyond declarations of what he'll do to make up for all that he's done. But we've seen how Jesus treats other people who immorally handle money before. And it ain't this pretty. And if Zacchaeus had heard any of the stories about Jesus, I'm surprised he hurried down and was happy to welcome Jesus. So it gets me wondering. It gets me wondering if we've been misunderstanding this story from the time we sang about Zacchaeus as a wee little man until today. It gets me wondering if the story of Zacchaeus isn't much about Zacchaeus at all as it is about God saying, wait for it. Because while the New Revised Standard Version reads that after Jesus calls him down from the tree, Zacchaeus proclaims that he will give half of his things to the poor and pay back fourfold any fraud, the Greek does not. The Greek says he does, which is carried over into the common English Bible in which Zacchaeus says, look, Lord, I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anyone, I repay them four times as much. And while the New International Version has Zacchaeus saying, here and now I give, Eugene Peterson paraphrased the passage with a little more defensiveness. Zacchaeus just stood there, a little stunned. He stammered apologetically, M Master, I give away half of my income to the poor. A and if I'm caught cheating, I pay four times the damages. And immediately, right then and there, Jesus proclaims Zacchaeus is a son of Abraham, a good Jew. No confession, no commission, just connection. Just connection. And so it gets me wondering, it gets me wondering if the story isn't about Zacchaeus, but about the crowd. Because the crowd was so quick to judge Zacchaeus by what he did, rather than who he was, they wouldn't even notice the good he was doing for their community. His profession was just a litmus test, because no one on that side could be that good. But Jesus came forward and said, wait for it. I wonder what happened to Zacchaeus after that day, after Jesus came over for supper. Did Jesus' declaration hit the heart of the crowd who now saw him as a Jew just as worthy of respect as anyone else? Did they resent him for the attention he got and grumble to each other about the special treatment that even Jesus couldn't stop giving those people? Did they go around still thinking that every tax collector was a spy and a crook? Or did they withhold their judgment and yield to understanding, hearing God's call that we wait for it? 
I wonder if that is why God responded to Habakkuk's plea when he got so trapped, he got angry. When the impatient are called to patience, could it be a plea from our Creator not to get caught up in the whirl of this world, the adulation of action, the celebration of stereotype in order to stay speeding? Real understanding takes time, an increasingly precious commodity in our caffeinated world. When we slow down, we might actually see the lost, the ones God came down to seek and to save. When our minds stop buzzing, our bodies stop jittering, we can start to know. Know each other. Know our God. Can we wait for it? Let us practice a way of slowing down by ending with a prayer, a contemplative prayer, a prayer that can help us focus. It may be uncomfortable. It may feel just right. All I ask is a willingness to try. Be prepared for silence interspersed with a single verse. May we hear the still, small voice of our God. May we pray? Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am. Be still and know. Be still. Be. Be still. Be still and know. Be still and know that I am. Be still and know. I am God.